Putnam's Magazine, Volume 7, February 1910, Number 5. A Half Forgotten Heroine. Ida Lewis, The Lighthouse Keeper in Newport Harbor. By J. Earl Clausen. If there were some people out there who needed help, I would get into my boat and go to them even if I knew I couldn't get back. Wouldn't you? Ida Lewis, keeper of Lime Rock Lighthouse in Newport Harbor. Now approaching her 68th birthday. Yet as sprightly and alive with nervous energy as at any period of her life. Imparted equal vigor to statement and question. The caller glanced through the crystal clean kitchen window across the waters of the harbor, rippling and dancing under summer sunshine. There was nothing terrifying in the outlook. The day was warm, and a plunge into the brine was a not unattractive suggestion. But those who have experienced the fury of the sea arc never misled a second time by the glinting calm of dog days. The harbor, which in August appeared so beautiful, would be merciless in February and March. The southwest breeze which caressed its surface into gentle undulations, would three months later become the dreaded nor'easter. Lashing the waters into a choppy, freezing fury. The ramparts of Lime Rock and Little Lime Rock, which now seemed placed only for the graceful drapery of weed which hung from them at low tide, would a little later be rimmed about with ice and resound to the crash of the breaking surge. Wouldn't you? Miss Lewis repeated the question, but not insistently, for without pressing her collar she continued. We have only one life to live, and when our time comes we've got to go, so it doesn't matter how. I never thought of danger when people needed help. Such times you're busy thinking of other things. Half forgotten by a public. Whose ears rang with her praises two generations ago, and approaching the time of life when rest and reflection are considered appropriate. The keeper of Lime Rock Lighthouse still attends to her important duties as faithfully and capably as at any previous period during her 53 years residence on the rocky island. Daily, she pursues a round of labor which would exhaust many a stronger woman, and there is never an hour throughout the night when she does not consciously awaken, attentive to the red glow which assures her the light is fulfilling its mission. Most impressive of all, perhaps, in her long tale of service, is the fact that she has spent only a half dozen nights off the rock since she became keeper. In 1879, there is nothing especially imposing about Lime Rock Lighthouse itself. It is a square whitewashed block of a building. Two stories high, with a one-story L which has the general appearance of an afterthought conceded to household requirements. This structure is mounted on an island rock of a dozen times or so the area occupied by the house itself. The light is at the top of a pier erected against the front of the building, approachable from within and placed rather with a view to its utility than to harmony with the tenets of architecture. Scenically the location of the house is admirable, for its windows command a view of everything worth seeing on the harbor side of the city. To the west Fort Adams surmounts the bluff. To the south the well-kept lawns of two or three great estates reach down to the water. Eastward lies the city, and northward the full stretch of Newport's Anchorage Basin, plentifully besprinkled with yachts during the season, with the Federal Torpedo Station and settlement on Goat Island to lend variety to the scene. From such vantage ground Lime Rock Lamp's red beam spells danger in a close approach, it tells the experienced skipper of shoals on the one side and rocks on the other, and vessels entering the harbor by the southern channel keep it well to starboard. It is the character of its keeper, not of the lighthouse, that has given Lime Rock a place in the conversation of the country at various times during the past 40 years. Born in Newport in February 1842, Ida Lewis was a girl of 15 when her father, Hosea Lewis, received the appointment of Keeper of Lime Rock Light, and moved thither with his wife, children and a small collection of household goods. Ida, the oldest of the four, had ample opportunity to familiarize herself with the whims of the ocean, both by observation and by first-hand experience, for on her devolved the duty of rowing the skiff which took the younger ones each day to and from the mainland where they attended school. The knowledge thus gained served her well when, on a September afternoon in 1859, two years after the family's exodus to Lime Rock, she saw a cat boat which had been maneuvering in the harbor capsized by a sudden squall. Jumping into her skiff, she rowed to the aid of its passengers, and bearing in mind the instructions her father had given, presently drew, one by one, four young men over the stem of her small craft. This was the first of a series of rescues which covers a period of nearly half a century. 
Among the rescued were Lieutenant Whedon King, an army officer, who, two years thereafter, was to give his life for his country on the field of Bull Run. Blamed de Young of a naval and antebellum Newport family. A Philadelphian named Smith, and a physician, probably now the only survivor of the quartet, who makes his home at Newport. The exploit was a sufficiently notable one, but attracted only local attention. As did her next rescue, which took place in February, 1866. She was then on the verge of being 24 years old. A Fort Adams soldier was returning to barracks at dusk after city leave. A stiff sea caught and overturned his skiff, leaving him wallowing in the wash until the strong arms of the lighthouse keeper's daughter, who had heard his cries for aid, pulled him aboard her skiff. Whether, as some said, a lad who had been taking the soldier home was drowned. Miss Lewis never knew definitely, her acquaintance with the rescued man was limited to one evening. And the heroine of Lime Rock is extraordinarily incurious. Her next opportunity to defeat the hungry sea was delayed until the full lowing January, when three farmhands gave her the chance. They were driving a flock of sheep along the highway which runs at the water's edge rather less than half a mile south of the lighthouse. Their woolly charges made a break for the ocean, and the zealous shepherds set sail in an unseaworthy boat to turn the sheep shoreward. The harbor was rough, the farmers were unskilled in boatmanship and Miss Lewis' services were once more in demand. The thoroughness of her methods is shown by the fact that, after putting the men ashore, she rounded up the sheep and saw them started for home. In November of the same year, 1867, Newport Harbor again demonstrated its capacity for getting people into trouble by capsizing a catboat manned by a couple of sailors. In justice to the harbor, it is no more than fair to say that there was a gale blowing at the time. The men were so fortunate as to get to Little Lime Rock, only a stone's throw from the lighthouse, where they clung until Miss Lewis reached them in her ubiquitous skiff. In point of distance traveled, the incident was unimportant, measured by the difficulty of the feat it was of real consequence, for directing the movements of a skiff in a gale around the jagged shores of those two isolated rocks requires seamanship of a high order. Here, then, up to 1868 were ten rescues to the credit of a slender girl 25 years old, whose fame, nevertheless, had not spread beyond her native state. A year and a half later, the 29th of March, 1869, occurred the rescue which directed the attention of the entire country to this remarkable woman. The participants in the affair, besides Miss Lewis, were two Fort Adams soldiers and a boatman who was taking them back to barracks. It happened that in the evening of the day in question Miss Lewis, then a woman of 27, was nursing a severe cold and sat with shoes off toasting her feet in the lighthouse kitchen oven. Across her shoulders for additional warmth a towel had been thrown. Around Lime Rock howled a winter blizzard, which threshed the waters of the harbor into a wicked sea, and sent heavy rollers from the northeast crashing against the island. The sudden there came to Miss Lewis' ears. Above the roar of the tempest. A sound with which by this time she had become familiar. The cry of men in distress. Instantly she sprang to her feet and threw open the kitchen door. Her mother besought her to remain at home, but the girl could entertain only the single idea that her path of duty led to the open water. It was a hard struggle, strong though she was, to guide her skiff to the spot from which the cries continued to come, but at last. She found the capsized boat and drew the two soldiers, almost exhausted, aboard her own craft. The boatman was lost. The story of this exploit was spread broadcast over the country, gaining still wider circulation when Harper's Weekly printed a page of pictures of the Lime Rock heroine, with an article which did justice to the sensational features of the incident and recounted her previous experiences in saving life. The fact was also made public then, for the first time, that her father, seven years before, had become totally crippled as a result of an apoplectic stroke, and Miss Lewis had kept the light burning as faithfully and skillfully as any keeper in the country. The story of her bravery started a wave of enthusiasm across the country which reached its height at Newport. Her fellow townspeople agreed that such courage as she had displayed was worthy of more than verbal recognition. A public subscription was started, and on a day memorable in Miss Lewis' life she was summoned to the mainland, where she was the center of a big demonstration and became the recipient of a beautiful little surf boat which had been christened the Rescues. Toward it equipment the Narragansett Boat Club of Providence contributed a silver rudder yoke and a boat hook. 
Colonel James Fisk, then at the head of the navigation company which operated the Fall River line of steamers, gave a silk pennant on which was painted a picture of Lime Rock and its lighthouse and the name of the boat. And a little later had a house erected for the rescue, where it still hangs at its davits. A gold watch and chain were the tokens of appreciation from the soldiers of Fort Adams. The Life Saving Benefit Association of New York voted its silver medal to Miss Lewis. The Cirrhosis Society of New York elected her to honorary membership and sent a gold pin, the insignia of the organization, and the General Assembly of Rhode Island adopted resolutions commending her bravery. A handsomely engrossed copy of which was sent to her. After the flurry of adulation had spent itself, Miss Lewis' life returned to its former channel, of quiet routine. As her mother's health was failing, most of the care of the house devolved upon the laughter, as well as the labor of watching the light and of nursing her father, who in the closing years of his life was unable even to cut his own food. It was not until November, 1877, that she made her next rescue. Again Fort Adams furnished the material. Three soldiers in a catboat ran on a reef to the west of the lighthouse. There was some sea running when Miss Lewis took them off but the affair was not attended by great danger. In 1879 the federal government at last showed its appreciation of her services, an act of Congress passed in that year making her keeper of the light in place of her father, who had died. Two years later, the 4th of February 1881, she showed that her courage had suffered no diminution with the passage of the years, by saving two soldiers from drowning in circumstances only a shade less hazardous than those that surrounded her famous exploit of 1869. The imperiled men had attempted to walk across the ice which in severe winters forms between Newport and the fort. Saltwater ice, always treacherous, is especially unreliable when softened by a day or two of sunshine, and the pair, plunged into the chill water, seemed in a fair way to sink from exhaustion before Ida Lewis, who had seen them break through, could reach them with the rope she had carried out. Apparently no thought that she herself would strike a weak spot in the icy flooring troubled her, and as good luck would have it she landed both men on a safe footing. In recognition of this, and a total of at least 13 rescues, Congress voted her its gold medal of the first class, and the Massachusetts Humane Society rewarded her with its silver medal, which then for the first time went to a woman outside of the Bay State. The soldiers at Fort Adams subscribed towards the purchase of an elaborately engraved silver teapot, and the general commanding the forces at the fort gave her a purse of gold. One more defeat of the waters, and a mild one by comparison, completes her record to date. That was in August, 1906, when one of two women who were rowing from Newport to visit the heroine of Lime Rock fell out of the boat as it approached the lighthouse and was brought to safety by her prospective hostess. It was in 1906, also, that she became a life beneficiary of the Carnegie Hero Fund to the extent of a monthly pension of $30, and in the same year the American Cross of Honor Society conferred on her its gold medal. Around Lime Rock stretched the panorama of a perfect summer morning, and the slight, active, hatless figure whose straw-colored hair, quite untouched by gray, was tossed by the soft southwest breeze, seemed suited to the place, as those do who live long in the same spot. I suppose you want to look at the lighthouse? she asked. Its interior looked the embodiment of cozy comfort, and everything from the light under the roof and the keeper's room, with the bed so placed that she can look at any moment of wakefulness to assure herself that the lamp is burning brightly, down to the kitchen, which serves as the family sitting room, is spotless. All conveys an impression of old-fashioned New England housekeeping, the mistress of the house confirms it. For Ida Lewis has the distinguishing traits of an cast of the Connecticut River woman of her age and station in life. Quaint words and phrases of an earlier day sprinkle her speech. Her brother Rudolph, who with her cocker spaniel Dewey, and her half-dozen cats shares the island home, was brought up like a cade lamb, and is now getting the attention she has been called upon to give each member of the family in turn. General Grant, who, with Vice President Colfax, visited her after her wonderful exploit of 1869 was blazoned to the world as a very kind gentleman. She speaks without hesitancy, yet equally without enthusiasm, of her memorable deeds and the trophies which arc their scant reward, and displays far more interest in a discussion of the state of her health and of the various illnesses which have been woven into the warp of the family's history. Her memory was invoked regarding the rescue of the two soldiers who broke through the ice. I was pretty strong then, she said.
It was hard work pulling those men out to strong ice, and it made my arms lame, but today I couldn't do it at all. Why, the other day Rudd, that's what we call my brother, you know, his name's Rudolph, Rudd asked me to help him lift a ladder, and he said, you haven't got any more strength than a cat. I told him I was lifting all I could. But lately I haven't been feeling very well, nervous, you know. Maybe it's my heart. I don't know. But then, I'm getting old. It was not easy to associate the thought of age with the nimble, energetic person who sat rocking and talking in the kitchen. Many a woman of less than 50 looks older, and few 67 and a large fraction look as young, even in this day of girlish grandmothers. I don't know as I ever was afraid. She replied reflectively to a question. I just went, and that was all there was to it. Now, my mother, she wasn't like me. That night when the two soldiers were tipped out of their boat. I was sitting here with my feet in the oven. I had a bad cold. But when I heard those men calling, I started right out. Just as I was, with a towel over my shoulders, and mother begged me not to go. She was so nervous she nearly fainted away while I was out there. But then she was sickly quite a time. It was my father who showed me how to take people into my boat. You have to draw them over the stern or they will tip you over. Sometimes they have caught hold of the gunnel, and then I have to make them let go until I can get them around to the stern. She passed from the account of rescues and her method to the story of her mother's illness, which developed into a cancer. In addition to the loss of father and mother since she went there to live, Miss Lewis has been called on to mourn the deaths of a brother and sister, both of whom fell victims to tuberculosis. Her belief in the permanence of wedlock is as old-fashioned as the rest of her views and principles. As might be expected, she carries it into her own life, for Miss Lewis has been married. She is never spoken of otherwise than as Miss Lewis, but her lawful name is Mrs. Wilson. Her husband was a sometime sailor and fisherman and her married life was not a pleasant experience. The couple did not live together long. Accordingly, Miss Lewis expresses herself freely as in favor of separation when a mistake has occurred, but is rigidly opposed to divorce. Whom God has joined together let no man put asunder. She repeats with the air of one not open to conviction. A list of Miss Lewis callers since she leapt into fame 40 years ago, would include a large proportion of the well-known people who have journeyed to Newport during that time, and her personal friends and correspondents among the prominent are many. Admiral Dewey was a frequent visitor when he was chairman of the Lighthouse Board, and being a Vermonter by birth found a responsive chord in the makeup of the courageous little Yankee woman. General Sherman paid her a visit. Mrs. Susan B. Anthony was among her admirers, as still as Dr. Mary Walker, and Mrs. French E. Chadwick, wife of the retired Rear Admiral, is one of her staunch friends. But there is another phase to this side of her life. For at times her shoals of visitors have assumed the proportions of a nuisance. She has shaken hands with more than 600 in a single day. Sometimes they stand over there on the shore, she said, pointing to the nearest mainland, and motion for me to come over after them with a boat. I couldn't do that. They bother dreadfully when I have washing or cooking to do. Not but that I like to see people. She hastened to add out of consideration for her visitors' feelings. I never saw the time when I didn't have a pleasant word for everybody. Now Rudd is different. He often says he wishes there never'd been a rescue. But I tell him he don't have to talk with people if he don't want to. A typical New England housekeeper of the old-fashioned type carrying her strict, simple devotion to duty into an unusual environment as Ida Lewis, the heroine of Lime Rock. Carefully she gathered up her medals and keepsakes and replaced them in the little work basket which serves as their repository, commenting the while on the dampness which loosened the hinges of their leather cases. She looked around the kitchen and remarked that the building would have to be painted in the fall. Dewey, the fat cocker spaniel, followed her as she accompanied her collar down to the dock, and finding the outlook agreeable and the effort of returning to the house too much of a tax on his willpower at the moment, he continued to sit there as the collar started off to the city, and the heroine ambled nimbly back to the preparation of her brother's dinner.